Hello, friends, and welcome to Brainworms, the podcast that has you constantly asking, was that a joke or a cry for help? I'm Joe. And today we're presenting you with Bronze Age mysticism. This is Kane. I did it wrong. Let's start that over, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Chris. No, no, I, I did it wrong. <laughs> okay. We need to start it over so that I can leave the beats for David. <laughs> God damn it. I'm Joe. And I'm Chris. What the fuck? Why did you do that? Why did you do that? Don't look at me. Wait till I say I'm Kane, Chris, and then you say <laughs> that you're Chris. All right, you're last. All right, last. And I'm Chris. All right, let's do it for real. I'm Joe. And we bring you this Bronze Age mysticism, and I'm Kane. And I'm Chris. There we go. Much better. And uh, we're going to continue our deep dive this week. Bronze into... Age mysticism. Bronze Age. I mean, essentially, yeah into uh left behind made famous by the movie with kurt cameron yep or the movie with nicholas cage you know what honestly i kind of want to watch the one with nicholas cage in it the subject matter is garbage okay right. it's like kevin sorbo garbage all right yeah, yeah. but i want to see nick cage be fucking nick cage in the left behind movie it does sound pretty fun <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about james cameron is a titan of intellect and you should watch all of his movies they are no one's talking about james their, cameron in their reasoning and execution what do you what watch all of james can no uh, uh who, who's the other one we're talking Kurt about cameron? is that you're talking about <laughs> no just you know what chris you know what? just sit down just you, no, actually, actually, yeah, that works for both. <laughs> I mean, James Cameron has some decent movies. Yeah, James Cameron has some great movies. Yeah, but when he tries to like, I have a message to say. Sure. It gets it gets. Yeah, really... yeah. What movie had the message that offended you? I mean, definitely Avatar was yeah, very heavy handed really in its messaging. Stupid. Okay, that's one. That's one. What's the other? Or is uh, Avatar t- so bad that it overshadows all I mean, of his kinda, other work? Yeah. He, yeah, like, it, it would be one thing if it was just a movie, but did you, like, hear how he was talking about it? Like, I, it, it needed to wait till the technology caught up to the story, and it's like, this is his Dances with Wolves, man. Yeah. Fern Gully. Fern Gully, yeah. Uh, but yeah, wait, wait, left, yeah, we're talking uh, about Left Behind We're again. talking about Left Behind, which is propaganda for the theory of premillennial dispensation, which is based on, at best, Biblical min- min- blah, 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 blah. biblical misinterpretation and at worst outright fabrication and lies. Most likely it's just Bronze Age mysticism. Bronze Age mysticism. But not even Bronze Age mysticism, which seems to be your catchphrase for some reason. Because the Bronze you know Age what? mysticism. I'm never going to say it again the rest of this episode. Good You're job, never going to say Joe. what again? That, that phrase. I'm not going to say it. What, Joe, what's he talking about? He's. Did, what are we? What are we doing? What is this bit? Can, can we just? All right, look. I'm gonna be honest. David got too close to my enclosure, and I got him. Yeah. The good news is we have the technology to make another one. Well, no, no, I didn't need him. I still have him. Okay. So you're gonna give him back when we're done with this? Uh, see, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing, right? Uh-huh. Uh, he has physiology that I don't currently have because you guys didn't set up the technology correctly yeah so i'm going to take that from him and add it to myself yeah can you just give him back when you're done i just need to take these bits and once i take these bits i'm gonna let him out yeah yeah okay which is going to conveniently be just in time to start reading the book he's not gonna even know anything happened all right Right. it's all fine good he's been asleep this whole time sure sure uh so yeah we're gonna read left behind i i was gonna go on a whole thing about the bad religious propaganda in it but you fucking know you fucking but you know, know you know i yeah. hope you know you should you listen to the list of, you're smart people yeah you know what's going on i'm pretty sure that there are like christians that denounce this <laughs> oh yeah absolutely this is a very specific like this evangelical end times thing is a very specific do me a favor hmm? the drugs i've got in them are getting ready to wear off i'm gonna put yeah. them back outside the enclosure yeah, uh, yeah just uh, don't let him know don't let him know it happened. yeah, yeah he, he'll forget like if Chris remembered half the things that we've used the the grade C amnestics to make him forget, that's an SCP Foundation reference, then he would be constantly horrified. Uh, so yeah, it's fine. We're, we're very yeah. comfortable with erasing memories here. All right, he's, he's coming too. Cool. So yeah, we're going to read Left Behind some more. But before we jump into that, I'm going to remind you to go to wegiveyoubrainworms.com where you can support us on Patreon, give us your fun bucks. 
and jump into our funky fresh discord server i'm trying to ignore the fact you called it fun bucks <laughs> it's a fucking it's like a pandemic and an economic crisis and you're calling it fun bucks i mean that's just because i'm contemptuous of the concept of currency as a thing no it's 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 <laughs> right, okay, okay, guys, guys, guys 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 we got it it's moon right. currency act like nothing happened act like nothing happened yeah yeah david hey read the book The prosperity brought about by the miracle formula changed the course of history for Israel. Flush with cash and resources, Israel made peace with her neighbors. Free trade and liberal passage allowed all who loved the nation to have access to it. What they did not have access to, however, was the formula. I, I love that. You know what they really needed to solve the conflict in the Middle East? Just, just needed some corn. You know, plant some yeah. corn down there. That'll fix it. And, you know, clearly holding on to it is the way to make sure that all of your mm -hmm. neighbors who are in incredibly impoverished and desperate circumstances are just like, sure. Yeah, yeah we're, we, we're we friends love now. You now. It's fine. Buck had not even asked the old man to reveal the formula or the complicated security process that protected it from any potential enemy, maintaining that secret ensured the power and independence of the state of Israel. Never had Israel enjoyed such tranquility. The walled city of Jerusalem was only a symbol now welcoming everyone who embraced peace. The old guard believed God had rewarded them and compensated them for centuries of persecution. Chaim Rosenzweig was honored throughout the world and revered in his own country. Global leaders sought him out, and he was protected by security systems as complex as those that protected heads of state. As heady as Israel became with newfound new glory, the nation's leaders were not stupid. A kidnapped and tortured Rosenzweig could be forced to reveal a secret that would similarly revolutionize any nation in the world. Ah, uh, two decades what? ago when we didn't think heads of nation could be stupid. Yeah. <laughs> the idea of some kind of scientific formula that makes agriculture possible in desert land is the most interesting part of this whole book. Yeah. You could get a way better fucking book out of that concept. Imagine what the formula might do if modified to work on the vast tundra of Russia. A fucking what? Could regions bloom, though snow covered most of the year? Was this the key to resurrecting that massive nation following the shattering of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics? I think that their problems run deeper than food sources. Russia had become a great brooding giant with a devastated economy and regressed technology. All the nation had was military might, every spare mark going into weaponry. You know, that, that's all they have. And the switch from rubles to marks had not been a smooth transition for the struggling nation. Streamlining world finance to three major currencies had taken years. But once the change was made, most were happy with it. Huh, all if only of these Europe writers knew Russia. how much. Okay. Uh, all if only... Your... God damn it. <laughs> Joe, you go. Uh, if only these writers knew how much America spent on military hardware. <laughs> if you mean like more than half of all spending? Yup. Well, you know, it's... I, I do understand that, as Robert Heinlein put it, the most expensive hobby in the world is the second most powerful military. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. All of Europe and Russia dealt exclusively in marks. Asia, Africa, and the Middle East traded in yen. Of all the things, that's the dumbest one I've heard. <laughs> North and South America and Australia dealt in dollars. A move was afoot to go to one global currency, but those nations that had reluctantly switched once were loath to do it again. This must have been right about the time the euro was being discussed mm -hmm. as a thing and fear that that would lead to the Antichrist you know, yeah, yeah, right, I remember yeah. those days. You know, I remember the world was so much better before the transatlantic cable. Ever since that happened, you know, that's that started <laughs> bringing about the end time. You did bring up a very interesting point about how the ideas that are just are this book became the the kind of peak crazy that we're seeing the the product of now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Nothing exists in a vacuum. Right. Honestly, that's one of the things that I was kind of hoping to get out of this podcast to begin with was looking at and examining the things that uh, set the narrative for, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, because this, this shit didn't go away. 
We just stopped talking about it. Right. And I'm sure it's still incredibly popular in some circles. Oh, yeah. Shit, I, I might be making this up, but I'm pretty sure I saw like a Left Behind coloring and activity book at one point not that long ago. Wouldn't be surprised. I know they did loads of spinoffs and like young adult novels, which that might be fun. Because you, you know <laughs> how much Jesus was into, you know, marketing his message, you know, profiting yeah, off of huge it. Fan. Yeah, big fan. Big fan. Yeah. I mean, he, he he did have a natural sort of showmanship about him, like the whole carrying of the cross, the crucifixion. That's showmanship right there. That's, uh... Yeah. Remember Theater. when he was just so happy when people were profiteering off of the Holy Temple? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, really, he really liked it. He took it real well. I saw in uh, New Orleans, shit, fucking 20 years ago now, there was literally a strip mall that had a bail bondsman and a bank on either side of a Baptist church. So technically all one building. And I just, I stopped yeah. and I stared at that for like two solid minutes before mm. I could move on again. <laughs> just That's a visual metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> Should have like taken a picture. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I mean, this was 20 years ago. I didn't have a camera on me. What? Yeah. There were no phone cameras? What, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> Frustrated at their inability to profit from Israel's fortune and determined to dominate and occupy the Holy Land, the Russians had launched an attack against Israel in the middle of the night. The assault became known as the Russian Pearl Harbor. What? And because of his interview with Rosenzweig, Buck Williams was in Haifa when it happened. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. An attack that has nothing to do with Pearl Harbor becomes known as Pearl Harbor because America is the most important country in the world. If this book had been published like five years later, it would have been known as the Russian 9-11. Oh, you're yeah. right. Well pinned. <laughs> because, yeah, the authors are American and they can't imagine any sort of world where America is not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember that one attack that happened in, uh, 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 what, what was it? World War One. that was known as the... The German World War, uh, Pearl Harbor. <laughs> I, I wouldn't put it beyond this author to actually say that. Yeah. <sighs> this is very stupid. Also, again, if, if there's a discovery that makes it possible for Israel to blossom fucking corn out of the desert and feed its people and effectively get rid of poverty, mm -hmm. and your response to that is to keep it secured and ensure that no one else can have access to it without, uh -huh. I guess, paying you massive amounts of money or gating that means that people should fucking bomb you. Yeah. See, now that is an un that's an unchristian way of looking at it. If you read the Bible, you know how much Jesus was against charity. <laughs> 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 and David, I feel like these writers have very clear feelings about the Israel as a thing. And, and that's a discussion to have. Yeah. But I think they want you to feel that way. Oh, okay. I'm not yeah. sold on that. That's interesting. You might be I'm right. I'm not sold on that. I've listened to the kind of religious people who don't go on mission trips, who never have been to Israel, who don't read their Bible, and they will just talk endless and endless so amounts. So most of them? Yes. Just giving Israel and Jewish people just the mightiest of holy hand jobs. Mm. <laughs> holy hand jobs, the only sort Jesus can give. Holy hand jobs, Batman. <laughs> <sighs> the Russians sent intercontinental ballistic missiles and nuclear equipped MiG fighter bombers into and the And then region. Israel launched their nukes and started World War III? The number of aircraft and warheads made it clear their mission was annihilation. To say the Israelis were caught off guard, Cameron Williams had written, was like saying the Great Wall of China was long. That's unrealistic. Like, Israel <laughs> is surrounded by so many enemies. Yeah, like, and, they have to have their and eyes everywhere. I'm not an expert in, in fighter jets, but I don't think MiGs are stealth bombers by any stretch. Not that I know of, not unless it's like a new model. So if you sent a fucking fleet of them, like, I think someone would detect that pretty quickly. Yeah, probably China. And yeah. like, also, like, Israel has allies. Yeah. Yeah. Like the United they States. They also have nukes. By a, a long margin. Yeah. Yeah. When Israeli radar picked up the Russian planes, they were nearly overhead. <laughs> Israel's frantic plea for support from her immediate neighbors in the United States was simultaneous with her demand to know the intentions of the invaders of her airspace. 
By the time Israel and her allies could have mounted anything close to a defense, it was obvious the Russians would have her outnumbered a hundred to That's one. That's still unrealistic. Uh, it is unrealistic. Yeah, this but is you absurd. See, the destruction of Israel has to happen. Uh, okay, yeah. so instead of having this weird nebulous scientific formula, how about you have uh, someone invented a stealth nuke and then nuked Israel and no one can figure out who did it, so there's no retaliation? Yeah, I mean, if you're just pissing into the wind anyway in terms of your approach to realism, yet yeah, just invent a stealth nuke. It's fine. That'll get the point across and we don't have to get go through all this. <laughs> Yeah. They had only moments before the destruction would begin. There would be no more negotiating, no more pleas for a sharing of the wealth with the hordes of the north. Are you fucking kidding? If the Russians meant only to intimidate and bully, they would not have filled the sky with mm. missiles. Planes could turn back, but the missiles were armed all and targeted. Of the, all of so this was no grandstand play designed to bring Israel to her knees. Every Israeli citizen is required to join the military. And have military service mm -hmm. so that they can all mobilize immediately for this exact occurrence. How is mobilizing the troops going to take care of nuclear attack? Well, they're not yeah, nuking. planes and missiles like flying in. They have missiles and not the same as nukes. And again, if they have nukes and they launch the nukes from MiGs that they can clearly see, you can just launch your own nukes and then start nuking Russia. And then other people will start nuking. And then that's how you know, the end of the world happens when everyone starts launching mutually assured destruction. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, in fact, I'm fairly certain exactly what's about to happen here in the book that we're reading. I yeah. don't think that these authors know that everyone has nukes. No, this is all very stupid. They clearly have, based on presumably someone's interpretation of the Book of Revelations, a very clear sort of series of boxes that they have to tick. And they're just shitting and farting <clears throat> whatever fucking narrative justification they can come up with to tick all those boxes down the line what they're doing here chris is they're trying to make certain that like there are certain things that have to happen the holy land israel has to fall the temple has to be destroyed mm -hmm. before armageddon i appreciate can that Armageddon being the last battle on the field of Megiddo. And is all it Megiddo that. or a Megiddo? It's Megiddo, I believe. Yeah, I thought it was Megiddo. I was like, whatever. Is it Megiddo? Have I heard okay. this wrong my whole life? <laughs> I don't know. Either way, what they what they're doing here is they're making that happen. They're know, making the the fall of the temple and all of that happen, but they're making it so that the Israelis are the good guys. Exactly. I no, I I understand. Here's my issue with it. My issue is that in Christianity, the holy people, the holy land, are the Jews and Israel, right? It's kind of a big major piece in this, you know, the, in, in the Bible. I haven't studied, and I know just from picking up, like, minor information, just from, I don't know, talking to people about anything, these things that, like, this is completely unrealistic. How, how can you not write a better story than this? Because... To go with the actual nation of Israel, to go with the actual way that this would work, it would be very difficult to make Israel sympathetic. Just make the stealth nuke. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, stealth nuke. Stealth yeah. nuke's the way to go. But you also can't blame the Russians then. I mean, you can't if the Russians launch the stealth nuke. That's well, true. The point of the stealth nuke would be that no one would know, and that way you could avoid the a mutually assured destruction ending of the game. You need the mutually assured destruction, though, for it to be the apocalypse. But right. the point I don't think the point <sighs> is that Look, nice story, tell it to Reader's Digest. <laughs> <laughs> To say the Israelis were caught off guard, Cameron, oh, I already read that. I, I've gotten exactly one paragraph <laughs> since our... Chris got on a tear. <laughs> they had only moments before the destruction would begin. There would be no more, ne more negotiating. There was no message for the victims. Receiving no explanation for war machines crossing her borders and descending upon her, Israel was forced to defend herself. <laughs> knowing full well that the first volley would bring about her virtual disappearance from the face of the earth. With warning sirens screaming and radio and television sending the doomed for what flimsy cover they might find, doomed. Israel defended herself for what would surely be the last time in history. Now I see. Israel needs to be the victim. Yep. The first battery of Israeli surface-to-air missiles hit their marks and the sky was lit with orange and yellow balls of fire that would certainly do little to slow a Russian offensive for which there could be no defense. 
every military leader who knew what was coming expected to be put out of his misery in seconds when the fusillade reached the ground and covered the nation. From what he heard and saw in the military compound, Buck Williams knew the end was near. There was no escape. But as the night shone like day and the horrific deafening explosions continued, nothing on the ground suffered. The building shook and rattled and rumbled. And yet it was not hit. Outside, warplanes slammed the ground, digging craters and sending burning debris flying. Oh my god. Yet lines of communication stayed open. No other command posts had been hit. No reports of casualties. Nothing destroyed yet. Was this some sort of a cruel joke? Sure, the first Israeli missiles had taken out Russian fighters and caused missiles to explode too high to cause more than fire damage on the ground. But what had happened to the rest of the Russian Air Corps? Radar showed they had clearly sent nearly every plane they had, leaving hardly anything in reserve for defense. Thousands of planes swooped down on the tiny country's most populated cities. The roar in the cacophony continued. The explosion so horrifying that veteran military leaders buried their faces and screamed in terror. Buck had always wanted to be near the front lines, but his survival instinct was on full throttle. He knew beyond doubt that he would die, and he found himself thinking the strangest thoughts. Was there a god? Would death be the end? He crouched beneath a console, surprised by the urge to sob. This was not at all what he expected war to sound like, to look like. He had imagined himself peeking at the action from a safe spot. I actually kind of like that part, going off to war with an expectation. Yeah. Yeah, I think some of that was the strength of David's read, but, but yeah, that was... When the cities prose. are on fire with the burning flesh of men, just remember that death, death is not, not the end. end. Nice. Several minutes into the Holocaust, Buck realized he would be no more dead outside than in. He made his way to a door on rubbery legs. No one seemed to notice or care to warn him. It was as if they had all been sentenced to death. He forced open the door against a furnace blast and had to shield his eyes from the whiteness of the blaze. This should have been the opening of the book. This is way more interesting. Yeah. Instead of a flashback inside of a flashback? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're inside of a flashback right now, I think. I'm we not are. sure what level of Inception we're in here. But uh, yeah, opening the book with, this guy's a pilot and he wants to have an affair. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then leading into, this guy's a reporter who was literally there at the end of the world. Right. And he, he thought he was going to die. And here are all the things going on in his mind. Yeah, yep, yep. that would have been a good cold open. Yeah, we'll see, much like uh, the writer of Empress Teresa, these folks don't want to start their book with action. Right, right. Because that's a lazy, lazy crutch for hack writers. You know what would have been a really interesting <laughs> plot twist? Mm. So the planes are overhead, the missiles are launched, they're coming down, everyone's freaking out, and then just boom, 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 and then everyone goes out and all the missiles are dummies and all the planes fall out of the sky and they were just drones. Drone warfare wasn't really a thing in the late 90s, early 2000s. Neither is Jesus, Joe! <laughs> oh, Jesus was big in the 90s. Yep. <laughs> Jesus was big in Japan. Just to wrap uh, that up real 90s. quick, and then when, when everyone's done collecting themselves, when all of the, like, like yeah. the, oh, oh, it's not happening, and this wasn't sent by Russia, then everyone looks around and the formula's gone. <laughs> it was all a distraction. Which, you know, would then lead to the Israelis launching their own missiles and targeting... Russia and kicking off World War Three anyway, mm -hmm. which would be fun. Yeah. So we're just kind of script doctoring. <laughs> anyway. He forced open the door against a furnace blast and had to shield his eyes from the whiteness of the blaze. The sky was afire. He still heard planes over the din and roar of the fire itself, and the occasional exploding missile sent new showers of flame into the air. He stood in stark terror and amazement as the great machines of war plummeted to the earth all over the city. But they fell between buildings and in deserted streets and fields. And Buck stood there in the heat, his face blistering and his body pouring sweat. You, uh... What in the world was happening? You can't look at a nuclear blast and be okay. You can if you're in a refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> God fucking damn it. Then came chunks of ice and hailstones big as golf balls forcing Buck to cover his head with his jacket. The earth shook and resounded, throwing him to the ground. 
Face down in the freezing shards, the he felt rain wash over him. Suddenly, the only sound was the fire in the sky, and it began to fade as it drifted lower. After ten minutes of thunderous roaring, the fire Buck dissipated. Buck had radiation poisoning and died. <laughs> as clouds of smoke wafted away on a gentle breeze, the night sky reappeared in its blue blackness, and stars shone peacefully as if nothing had gone awry. Buck turned back to the building, his muddy leather jacket in his fist. The doorknob was still hot, and inside... Military leaders wept and shuddered. Because, you know, that, that's what they were promoted for. Their ability to hold up under stress. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to give them any flack for that. Nuclear holocaust, mm. I'm probably just going to fall to my knees and Hear weep the angel or voices. die of just, oh, fuck. You know, like, The, the point what that I'm do? addressing is I don't think that you make it very long in the military if your flight or fight response is set to flight. I don't know. You might. You certainly survive to see other battles. <laughs> he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. That's right. Lives to run another day, at least. Yeah. The radio was alive with reports from Israeli pilots. They had not been able to get airborne in time to do anything but watch as the entire Russian air offensive seemed to destroy itself. Miraculously, not one casualty was reported in all of Israel. Otherwise, Buck might have believed some mysterious malfunction had caused missile and plane to destroy each other. But witnesses reported that it had been a firestorm, along with rain and hail and an earthquake, that consumed the entire offensive effort. Had it been a divinely appointed meteor shower? Perhaps. Daylight revealed the carnage, and exposed Russia's secret alliance with Middle Eastern nations, primarily Ethiopia and Libya. Uh. Among the ruins, the Israelis found combustible material that would serve as fuel and preserve their natural resources for more than six years. <laughs> Special task forces competed with the buzzards and vultures for the flesh of the enemy dead. Buck remembered it vividly, as if it were yesterday. Had he not been there and seen it himself, he would not have believed it. Editors and readers had their own explanations for the phenomenon, but Buck admitted, if only to himself, that he became a believer in God that day. Oh my God. Scholars pointed out passages from the Bible that talked about God destroying Israel's enemies with a firestorm, earthquake, hail, and rain. Buck was stunned when he read Ezekiel 38 and 39 about a great enemy from the north invading Israel with the help of Persia, Libya, and Ethiopia. More stark was that the scriptures foretold the weapons of war used as fire fuel and enemy soldiers eaten by birds or buried in a common grave. Hmm. <sighs> so the Bible predicted that dead bodies would be eaten by carrion species? No way! <laughs> what will the Bible predict <laughs> next? Yeah. Christian friends wanted Buck to take the next step and believe in Christ now that he was so clearly spiritually attuned. He wasn't prepared to go that far. Wait, what? But he was certainly a different person and a different journalist from then on. If I was in Jerusalem and I saw bombers overhead and then suddenly they were stricken out of the air by God's wrath, you better believe I'd be a Christian. I don't think I would. I think I just know like, well, that was pretty weird. I would be tempted to go and join a fucking synagogue, though. Sure. Good point. Good point. <laughs> Not sure whether he'd follow through with anything overt, Captain Rayford Steele felt an irresistible urge to see Hattie Durham right then. What? It, it moved on. Real? Unless I spaced out, which is not impossible. That seemed like a real abrupt transition between those two thoughts. Yeah, let me, uh, let me take this back just a second here. So, Christian friends wanted Buck to take the next step and believe in Christ now that he was so clearly spiritually attuned. He wasn't prepared to go that far. But he was certainly a different person and a different journalist from then on. To him, nothing was beyond belief. Not sure whether he'd follow through with anything overt, Captain Rayford Steele felt an irresistible urge to see Hattie Durham right then. Yeah, that would have been a good place for <laughs> end of chapter one, chapter two. Or even like a paragraph break of some, like, yeah, there, th it does start a new paragraph, but it's not, yeah, it's not clearly delineated in any way. Like there could be a dash or anything, a, mm -hmm. a nice flourish, just something. Yeah. Cause I genuinely thought that I just hardcore disassociated and, and lost just time. missed the transition. Yeah. 
I mean, I've been trying to do that. <laughs> How's it going? It's not going well. No. Has not this sure. book made its... Oh, we're, we're not. We're still reading. Good. Uh, I mean, it's up to y'all. We've got two and a half pages remaining. Uh, we'll finish the chapter and Ugh. then close it out. <laughs> I like to at least do that. Okay. Same. Not sure whether he'd follow through with anything overt, Captain Rayford Steele felt an irresistible urge to see Hattie Durham right then. He's so <laughs> horny for Hattie Durham. He unstrapped himself and squeezed his first officer's shoulder on the way out of the cockpit. That means you want to fuck him. Yeah. Yeah, if you make any kind of physical contact in a social setting, it means you want to bone down. That's right. We're still on auto, Christopher, he said as the younger man roused and straightened his headphones. I'm going to make the sunup stroll. Christopher squinted and licked his lips. Whoa. Doesn't look like sunup to me, Cap. Probably another hour or two. I'll see if anybody's stirring anyway. Roger. If they are, tell them Chris says hey. <laughs> Rayford snorted and nodded as he opened the cockpit door. Hattie Durham nearly bowled him over. No need to knock, he said. I'm coming. <laughs> the senior flight attendant pulled him into the galleyway, but there was no passion in her touch. Her fingers felt like talons on his forearm, and her body shuddered in the darkness. Hattie, she pressed him back against the cooking compartments, her face close to his. She need him in the groin. Had she not been clearly terrified, he might have enjoyed this and returned her embrace. That sure is a telling sentence. Yeah, like, it just got done describing how all of her body language lacked any amount of passion or affection. It was all, like... Terror. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It was all terror. But, you know, he, he he's just saying he might have enjoyed it. He, he might have been having a good time if she hadn't been so inconveniently terrified. <laughs> That's not what you focus on in a, in a situation where, like, hey, this thing is not behaving as it should. Something is up. Yeah, this person that I, you know, have been fantasizing about has come to me in obvious distress. Why did she have to fucking ruin my fantasy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Her knees buckled as she tried to speak, and her voice came in a whiny squeal. <laughs> I, I'm a woman, I'm so scared. Oh. People are missing, she managed in a whisper, burying her head in his <laughs> chest. I was making a joke, but that's what it is. Yep. He took her shoulders and tried to push her back. But she fought to stay close. He tried to calm her womanly terror, but he, he just couldn't. She was sobbing now, her body out of control. A whole bunch of people, just gone. Hattie, this is a big plane. They've wandered to the labs, or to the labs? Okay. Lavatories. Yeah, I, I get it. You know, probably not a lavalier microphone. But <laughs> who says labs instead of bathroom or head that might be normal airplane terminology i'm not be. sure yeah i don't know yeah she pulled his head down so she could speak directly into his ear despite her weeping she was plainly fighting to make herself understood i've been everywhere man i'm telling you dozens of people are missing hattie it's still dark we'll find i'm not crazy see for yourself all over the plane people have disappeared it's a Why joke. Why are you not taking this seriously? Yeah. They're hiding, trying to... Ray, their what? shoes, their <laughs> socks, <laughs> their clothes. Everything yes. was left Every behind. On the These plane people are to gone. Play a joke on you. And they stripped all their clothing off and hid. Either that or they all went down to the luggage room and they're banging hardcore in a giant orgy. Ah, uh, the luggage storage <laughs> orgy. <high> club. <laughs> <laughs> Hattie slipped from his grasp and knelt whimpering in the corner. Rayford wanted to comfort her, to enlist her help, or to get Chris to go with him through the plane. Or to touch her inappropriately. <laughs> More than anything, he wanted to believe the woman was crazy. She knew better than to put him on. It was obvious she really believed people had disappeared. Why don't you go He had look? been daydreaming in the cockpit. Was he asleep now? He bit his lip hard and winced at the pain, so he was wide awake. He stepped into first class, where an elderly woman sat stunned in the pre-dawn haze, pre haze, her husband's sweater and trousers in her hands. What in the world? she said. He started singing about Mickey Mouse and ran out the Rayford plane. Rayford scanned the rest of first class. Most passengers were still asleep, including a young man by the window, his laptop computer on the tray table. But indeed, several seats were empty. As Rayford's eyes grew accustomed to the low light, he strode quickly to the stairway. He started down, but the woman called to him. Sir, my husband. Rayford put a finger to his lips and whispered. 
I know. We'll find him. I'll be right back. What nonsense, he thought as he descended, aware of Hattie right behind him. This we'll is very find stupid. Him? It is very stupid. Hattie grabbed his shoulder and he slowed. Should I turn on the cabin lights? No, he whispered. The less people know right now, the better. Rayford wanted to be strong, to have answers, to be an example to his crew, to Hattie. But when he reached the lower level, he knew the rest of the flight would be chaotic. He was as scared as anyone on board. As he scanned the seats, he nearly panicked. This was no joke, no trick, no dream. Something was terribly wrong, and there was no place to run. There would be enough confusion and terror without his losing control. Nothing had prepared him for this, and he would be the one everybody would look to. But for what? What was he supposed to do? Try radioing? Like, command There center? is that. First one, then another cried out when they realized their seatmates were missing, but that their clothes were still there. They cried. They screamed. They leapt from their seats. Hattie grabbed Rayford from behind and wrapped her hands so tight around his chest that he could barely breathe. Must have been spontaneous human undressing. <laughs> Rayford, what is this? He pulled her hands apart and turned to face her. Hattie, listen. I don't know any more than you do, but we've got to calm these people and get on the ground. Now I'm just picturing Buck in the in the driver's seat, just t- like pointing the nose straight down, like gotta get to the ground. Gotta <laughs> I hope to Buck's the not piloting the plane. He's a reporter. Oh, they're all the same to me. Rayford's the pilot. Remember, these are not the same person. Oh. Jeez, man. It, it is hard because the, there are these just very abrupt transitions between POVs. Yeah. It is a little yeah. confusing. Oh, it's fucking of. whiplash. Why Try was he in the it. cockpit if he's not a pilot? No, no. Buck was just in the seat writing on his he laptop. He was in first computer. class. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Buck was just a convenient way for the readers to get an expository history dump. Mm-hmm. Instead of using that guy who easily... Could have been, you know, just a pilot in Israel at the time that on it happened. On a layover or whatever the on fuck. On vacation? Yeah, yeah, you know, any of those things. Instead of just using this guy. Wait, hang on real quick. Before we continue, yep. who is the main character that is in love with Hattie? Is that Buck? That's Rayford. That's the pilot. Okay. Rayford Steele. And Buck is a completely separate entity. Yes. Okay, mm-hmm. now I'm following. I like that you've got it figured out five minutes before we finish the chapter and never yep. talk about this book again. She nodded, but she didn't look okay at all. As he edged past her to hurry back to the cockpit, (laughs) he heard her scream. (laughs) Scream. (laughs) What? (laughs) Sorry. So much for calming the passengers, he thought as he whirled to see her on her knees in the aisle. She lifted a blazer, shirt and tie still intact. Trousers lay at her feet. Hattie frantically turned the blazer to the low light and read the name tag. Tony! She wailed. Tony's gone. Not Tony, a character we've never been introduced to. And then Tony was gone, I knew. Rayford snatched the clothes from her and tossed them behind the bulkhead. Fuck He lifted, <laughs> lifted Hattie by her elbows and pulled her out of sight. Starts slapping her. Hattie, Get herself together. Hattie, we're hours from touchdown. We can't have a plane load of hysterical people. I'm going to make an announcement, but you have to do your job. Can you? She nodded, her eyes vacant. He forced her to look at him. Will you? He said. She nodded again. Rayford, are we going to die? No, he said. That I'm sure of. Is that the first time he's touched her? It might have been. How about that? It doesn't count because he's not getting any emotional kickback from it, so it doesn't count. Nah, just grabbing her by the chin and forcing her to look at him. He's he's not enjoying it, so it doesn't count. But he wasn't sure of anything. He'd rather have faced an engine fire and even an uncontrolled dive. A crash into the ocean had to be better than this. How would he keep people calm in such a nightmare? (laughs) By now, keeping the cabin lights off was doing more harm than good, and he was glad to be able to give Hattie a specific assignment. I don't know what I'm going to say, he said. Get the lights on so we can make an accurate record of who's here and who's gone, and then get more of those foreign visitor declaration forms. For what? Just do it. Have them ready. Rayford didn't know if he had done the right thing by leaving Hattie in charge of the passengers and crew. As he raced up the stairs, he caught sight of another attendant backing out of a galleyway, screaming. By now, poor Christopher in the cockpit was the only one on the plane unaware of what was happening. Worse, Rayford had told Hattie he didn't know what was happening any more than she did. 
The terrifying truth was that he knew all too well. Irene had been right. He, and most of his passengers, had been left behind. <sighs> bum, bum, bum. So, here's my question. Because Irene is going to be raptured, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are they setting up Haiti or whatever her name was as his new romantic interest? Yeah, probably. Absolutely. Or, wait, Absolutely. wait. fucking lootly, yeah. Will they go the weird route of like, no, I married her, and even though she's dead, which voids any, you know, legal marriage thing. She's not dead. Yeah. She ascended while living directly to heaven. That, she did not die. Yeah, she took the express Isn't elevator. Isn't that sort of like... If I walked in on you and there was a bloody corpse down there and I just looked at you and you said, no, he's sleeping. Wasn't me. <laughs> you know, one thing I just, so of course, you know, there, there are different interpretations of this whole thing. <laughs> and even people who strenuously believe in the Bible will fight each other to the literal death mm. over interpretations of what it means as if that fucking matters when mm -hmm. frankly what it fucking means is be nice to each other yeah don't yeah. be a dick you know it, at any rate i digress if you go off of the strictest possible interpretation mm -hmm. then the rapture will happen to twelve thousand from each of the 12 tribes of israel sure that's one hundred and forty-four thousand. so people. less than one percent of the global population Oh, far less. We lose more than that every day. So if the rapture happened, we wouldn't actually know. No yeah. one would know. <laughs> it would just be yeah. kind of... Yeah, no one would fucking know. It would just be a bunch of people that mysteriously disappeared, and they would be missing person cases for, right. you know, forever. It could have happened a thousand years ago. How would sure. we know? We wouldn't know. This idea of, like, the, the doomsday rapture and, like, this interpretation of revelations is an idea called premillennial dispensationalism. And other smarter people than me can tell you more about it. But it's absolutely fucking off the rails. Like, they're using weird numerology and very specific interpretations of very specific translations that have been taken out of context. Are those the same sort of people that will argue about how the number of the beast is not actually 666, it is 616 because there was a misinterpretation of the original I Greek. I hope not because then, then we're, we're totally okay to use barcodes and that's not a sign of the end times at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that the number of the B666 thing figures into that belief. I don't know which way it swings in terms of the the mistranslation of the Greek. and the, I, I don't know. Personally, I'm a bigger fan of the uh, lover of the beast, 669. <laughs> nice. Or the neighbor of the beast, 667. <laughs> and 668 right across the street. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I have to say, of all the versions of Christianity in the Bible and all of that, my favorite has got to be the Bill Esquire and Ted interpretation of it. Be excellent <laughs> to each other. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And party on, dude. <laughs> yeah. That actually, I, I mean, not, not even kidding. That's basically a cornerstone of my personal <laughs> philosophy. Just don't be shitty. For a long time. Like, yeah. Don't be a dick. Try and make the world a better place than it was when you got here mm -hmm. and have a good time. I mean, that's really how you should live your life. And maybe a good note to close yep. on, unless somebody has anything spe anything specific to add about Left Behind. Fuck the Left Behind books, fuck the authors, and fuck Kirk Cameron. Sure. Yeah, yeah specifically absolutely. Kirk Cameron, yeah. I agree. What a disappointment, man. I don't know why, but like, just it felt like a after growing up watching growing pains uh -huh. and feeling like Kirk Cameron was, you know, someone that I knew to find out that he was associated with this and was the sort of person that he really, is. Really, really dumb. Just it, bananas. Yeah. yeah. Bananas <laughs> is an atheist's nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it, it felt like a betrayal right there on the level of finding out that fucking Ray Bradbury was a horrible racist. Mm hmm. I mean, we'll always have Mr. Rogers. Yep. I certainly hope so. Yeah. If anybody ever turns up anything at all bad about Fred Rogers, just keep it to your fucking self. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <for real. laughs> all right. We're clicking the thing.
well, yeah, I'm going to close us out. Don't forget to like, subscribe, click the YouTube bell if you're a YouTube listener. Go to wegiveyoubrainworms.com. You can support us monetarily, find our other projects, and literally shout at us via email. Uh, hopefully we don't get crazy religious Oh, weirdos. I hope we do. Please. <laughs> I'm sending you into the comments section to engage Better with yet, them. Better yet, send do. them to the Discord, the what room. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, God, whatever yeah. and whatnot. Send them to me. Yeah, if you want to have a debate on why you think that this, you know, this doomsday rapture theory is absolutely valid and the word of God and we should really take it seriously, uh, go to our Discord server, which you can also find at wegiveyoubrainworms.com, and we will be overjoyed to have a conversation with you about it. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go get in the furnace. Yeah, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to push the appropriate buttons. Uh, I think the only thing I can say at this point is... Jesus Christ, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're very sorry. All right, I'm going to do the thing. This has been a production of Brainworms Presents. Any copyrighted content contained within is used for purposes of review. Brainworms Podcast is David Combs, Kane Magdalene, Christian Shaver, and Joseph Wells. The theme music is Hodgepod Number 1 by Brian Davis. If you like what you heard, you can support us and learn about our other projects at wegiveyoubrainworms.com or by leaving a review on your favorite listening app. Holy hand jobs, the only sort Jesus can give. Ah.